Father God, I just pray today that your Holy Spirit would come into this tent and into our lives, God, and ignite a passion inside of us for you that cannot be denied. God, that cannot be denied, Lord. When we're touched by your presence and touched by your love, we are changed from the inside out. And I pray today that there would be an encounter with you like we have never experienced before. So God, we just give you this next hour. And we pray, God, that you would come and meet us here. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome to Abundant Life Community Church. For those of you uh, who are new, welcome to all of you. Those of you who we see all the time, welcome back to the tent. As always, the first week in the tent is always very interesting because we have to dial in the sound and we have to dial in uh, every part of it, the kids' ministry. So today, we are going to test our memory on the songs that we worship to because the projector is... Not cooperating with us, but that's okay, all right? We're, we're just going to keep worshiping anyway. Um, we're just glad that you're here, and we're going to have an encounter with Jesus today, and I'm just trying to think of any announcements that we have. Our women are on the women's retreat, and they're going to come back today, so we are expecting massive testimonies from their outing uh, this weekend. So could you just join me in just turning our hearts towards the Lord? turning our hearts towards him. We, we come and we gather because we want to encounter a living God. We're not interested in religion. We're not interested in a show. We're not interested in, in uh, impressing anybody. We're interested in Jesus. And when we turn our hearts towards him and set aside the things of the world and the things of the day, we're going to meet him, and he's going to touch us, he's going to change us, and he's going to show us that he's real. So would you pray as we get ready to go back into worship? Father God, I just thank you so much for this opportunity to come to worship you, to glorify you, to honor you, to lift you up, to put you on the throne of our hearts. So Holy Spirit, would you come and invade this tent? Touch your people, God. Inspire your people. Instruct your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So today, you guys, Pastor Eric's going to be preaching on Gideon, and he is somebody that he didn't know, like, he had low thoughts of himself. He was, like, the lowest, and um, this song that we're going to sing next is Who You Say I Am, and, like, if we could grasp what God says about us, like, it makes you want to jump. I have a hard time singing this song without wanting to jump, and... Yeah, so anyways, I don't know if you guys remember the words, but grab a hold of what God says about you. Yeah, you can look online. <laughs> Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me into his love.
Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. And giver of mercy, you my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. 
There's
That one more time out of faith. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Thank you, Jesus. I am a child of God.
this right here is my son, Arrow. He, uh, he's about a year and a half old. And as we were singing these last two songs, I just started thinking about this little guy. And you know, if you come to my house, like we've got tractors and trailers and cars and there's so much moving around everywhere. And like, whenever I come in after work with my work van and my trailer, I tell, the, tell him and his little brothers to go stand on the deck so I know exactly where you're at because I don't want, you know, to accidentally, you know what I'm saying? So um, he goes and they'll run right to the deck and they'll watch me pull in and whatever I'm driving. And I just thought that that was so interesting that he just completely trusts the fact that I'm going to make sure that he's safe, that he doesn't have to be afraid. He doesn't have to worry about an accident happening. He doesn't have to worry about anything. He trust his dad to take care of him. And we sing this song that Clara just sang that I'm going to ask you to sing again. And it talks about God being our defender. And I think that we need to get back to Arrow's place in life where we have complete trust in our God. And it's hard because as adults, we like to, we're analytic. We like to figure things out. We like to say, okay, this is how it's going to work. You know, we go through all that. And I know if we went around the room, there is all kinds of different situations, different scenarios, different emotional states and, and, and everything. But I think that there's an invitation in this moment to get back to this childlike faith where we are trusting that our God is going to work things out. And when he directs us, he's going to direct us to a place of safety and a place of comfort and in a place where we're not going to go under with the situations that are going on around us. And here's what I'm going to do, a little different. I'm going to ask Clara. I'm going to, I know her real well, so I'm going to put her on the spot. But I'm going to ask us, let's, let's just, we need to get to a place where we're receiving. And I'm going to ask Clara if you could sing that song over us again. And wherever you are, where, if you're in a place, you know, where, where you're struggling or if you're in a place where you're trying to figure things out, we just need to get back to the childlike faith where we are just trusting and surrendering to God. So we'll, I want you, Claire, just to sing that over your church, just like a chorus or so. And just, just receive from God, just surrender to God. sovereign. Lord, I thank you. You see the beginning and the end. God, I thank you that you are 
aware of every circumstance. You're aware of every trial. You're aware of every victory. That we are not alone in our lives. I thank you that you are a God who cares about the mundane. And you are a God who is interested in us personally. And you meet with us personally. And Lord, today as we move through the rest of this gathering, that you would reveal yourself to us all. That you would inspire us. You would convict us. You would touch us. You would heal us. You would set us free. today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. All right. Well, before I get into the, uh, to the talk today, is there an extra stand or something? Probably can't use that. No, I'll just leave it right there. Um, Are you sure? Yeah. A couple of announcements. Those of you who want to attend Accelerate Camp, registration should be opening this week. Within the next couple days, teenagers, uh, make sure that you guys re get registered for Accelerate Camp. It's going to be August 1st through the 5th, and we're going to be heading out to a church. We've rented a venue out in Aberdeen. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'd love to get our teens out there and... Uh, just uh, seeking God and having fun and making memories. I apologize for moving everything around. Can I turn this down? No? Okay. Well, before we, we get into it, uh, kind of how we got here this morning, uh, we kind of got here out of an abundance of caution. Uh, Mike Molner, our worship pastor, uh, is not feeling well, so we felt like out of an abundance of caution, he was going to stay home. And same with our wonderful pastor, Pastor Brad. He was also feeling under the weather, so he felt out of an abundance of caution that he was going to stay home. And how many of you know Pastor Brad would be here if his head was falling off? So for him to stay home, he had to really feel uh, like that was something uh, he wanted to do to make sure that. Uh, everyone is feeling uh, good, and there was no, there was no issues. Um, but I want to talk today about being ready. I received a phone call last night at about 5 o'clock that said, basically, you're preaching today. So immediately, as the good pastor that I am, let me stop and introduce myself. Those of you who don't know me, my name is Eric. I am the, well, I'm kind of like the next-gen pastor and the church-planting pastor. Uh, we're in a, the middle of a transition right now. My wife, Naomi, and I and our eight kids are transitioning into planting a church in the Graham uh, Spanaway area. We're very excited about that, but we're still serving all of you and your families in the next-gen position. So uh, we're having a lot of fun doing that. Continue to pray for this transition that God's best is for our teens and our students. But I got the call last night at about five, like I said, like, you know, and immediately when I get the call, okay, you're preaching in the morning, like, there's this panic that sets in. It's like, okay. Usually, you know, you like to have a little bit of time to prepare and to pray and to study, and I was like, okay, I got to pre. I want to serve the people. I want to make sure they have a good message from God's heart. Like, it was just like this moment where I was like, Oh, great, I'm going to fail. And then I felt like the Holy Spirit remind me of something interesting from my past. Anybody ever heard of Royal Rangers? Do we have any Royal Ranger people? You remember Royal Rangers? Royal Rangers, okay. When I was a kid, by the way, in 1985, I was straight arrow of the year. If that makes sense to anybody in you. There was, it was, Royal Rangers is like, I still have the plaque. My mom has it, if you don't believe me. Uh, anyway, so... 
the Royal Rangers is like the kind of the Christian equivalent of the Boy Scouts. So you do a lot of uh, outdoor activity, learning to tie knots, learning about knife, knife safety, a lot of different things. When we would get our knives, we would get what is called a tote and chip card. Does anybody, that ring any bells to anybody? Okay. Anyway. Well, then the next joke isn't going to be as funny as I had planned. So, because you get this card that says you're, you're officially safe to carry a knife, and every time you mess around with the knife, you get a corner off the card, and if you get all four corners off your knife-carrying card, they take away your knife. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a knife. So, <laughs> I'll get it back one of these days. <laughs> but it was, you know, knife throwing is fun, just not at church. So, anyway, uh, but we, we, would, we would, like, we would go to camp outs with all the guides, and I would run around like a, just a crazy kid, run around, have a lot of fun. But I remember there was a motto, the Royal Ranger motto, and this is what came into my spirit last night. The Royal Ranger motto was this, a Royal Ranger is ready, ready to work, play, serve, obey, worship, live, Etc. And that motto, we used to have to say that, I believe, before every gathering, before every time we would get together as young boys, and we'd say that. And like it was kind of uh, just put into my heart, into my spirit, that we need to live our lives ready. And that came up last night, and I felt like God was saying, You need to live ready. You need to be ready all the time. Why are you freaking out about putting together a teaching? You should be ready already to serve, to worship to live. And I I thought, you know what? That's a challenge I want to extend first to me, but then to all of us. Are we ready? We're living in times, we're living in an hour, we're living in a season where we need to be ready as believers. How many of you know culture changes quickly? Society changes quickly. Politics changes quickly. Uh, 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 local things change quickly. Things are changing so quickly. We need to be ready, and we need to be tapped into the source to make sure that we are victorious. So I'm going to read today out of Judges chapter 7. Verse 1, there's going to be a, 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 a bit of scripture, and like I, we apologize about not having the, the, we usually like to have the verse up on the board, so we apologize for all that. We'll get it dialed in. It's our first Sunday back at the tent, and I love being in this tent. How many of you know the Foursquare movement, which we are a part of, began in tents like this almost 100 years ago where Amy Simple McPherson would go around the country, set up tents like this, and have revival services and invite people from the community that would come and meet Jesus and be touched and healed by the power of God. But I'm going to read out of Judges chapter 7, a very well-known figure in Scripture named Gideon. Gideon's one of my favorite people because he always struggled with courage, and he always struggled with his identity, but God used him. Even when he made mistakes, God used him. Judges chapter 7, verse 1 through 3, I'm going to go all the way through 22, but I'm going to break it down a little bit. Early in the morning... Gideon and all his men camped at the spring of Harad. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men for me to deliver Midian, who was their enemies, into their their hands. In order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength saved her. Announce now to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. Imagine that. You're going up against your enemies. You got a good army going. You're feeling pretty good about yourself. But then you're like, I mean, these are the people that you're leading, right? You're like, okay, everybody who's afraid and trembling, you guys can go ahead and leave. You guys can go ahead and go home. And to your dismay, over half of everyone runs home. And you're left with half the people. I mean, imagine that. Imagine just the, 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 the craziness. We're actually a third of the people, my math. A third of the people. And I, I, I kind of wonder, what were those conversations like in that army? 
You know, fear, excuse me, spreads pretty quickly, doesn't it? It's like a cancer that just, that just moves in between people. And I was doing a little bit of research. In 2005, on August 31st, is one of the biggest known human stampedes of all time. This happened in Bangladesh, in Iraq. On August 31st, there was a, millions of people were making a pilgrimage to their uh, mosque in, I'm going to try and say this right, in al Qadamiyah. If I say it wrong, I, I apologize. But a million people were making that pilgrimage to, to, to Baghdad. I'm sorry. I don't know what, I think I said Bangladesh. That's in India. Baghdad. And as they were getting close to the Tigris River, they, there was a bridge that had been shut down to stop that pilgrimage from coming so people would go other ways, I believe. Someone in the crowd pointed his finger and said, there's a bomb on someone's chest. Widespread panic immediately moved through the crowd, and people were trampe- stomp, stampeded. They were trampled. They fell off the bridge. They ran onto the bridge. It collapsed. People died. 954 people perished within a matter of 30 minutes. One of the biggest stampedes in modern history. You can look it up on YouTube. And I just thought to myself, fear is so easily adapted. Why is that? Why do people grab hold of fear so easily and so quickly and just partner with it and just run with, with wherever it happens to take us? 2 Timothy 1.7 says this. It's a great reminder. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity. And to be a believer today, we cannot be a people who are afraid. We cannot be a people who are timid. We cannot be a people that shrink back when fear knocks on our door. We need to stand strong, and we need to keep our eyes on the Lord. But of power, of love, and of self-discipline. We need to silence in our lives the voices of fear. We need to silence in our lives the voices that will get us to doubt what our God says. Because at the very beginning of this passage, God said, you have too many men for me to give Midian into your hands. In other words, I'm going to give you the victory, but it's got to be me who does it. There's too much fear in the camp. There's too much things in the camp they are going to distract you from me giving it to you. I want this victory to be pure. There's a lot of voices out there that want to distract us from the victory that God has. And sometimes the victory on the horizon is hard to see. Sometimes we don't understand it. Like you've, if you've gone through tougher circumstances and hard circumstances and you're like, where is the victory? Where is the victory? You've had a financial fallout or your your health has gone bad or something. It's hard to see the victory when you're in the valley of fear, isn't it? In the valley of the shadow of death. But God is saying, do not give in to the fear. When we don't give in to the fear, we stay ready. We live our lives ready. Fear is going to hold us back from that. That one's not good enough? I guess I needed a leash. What? Check. Oh. I was just starting to get going, too. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I don't know. I let myself talk all the time. So, anyway, okay. Gideon, fear, back at it. Here we go. We don't want to partner with fear. Part, fear is easy to partner with. When we partner with fear in our circumstances and fear in our lives, we can't be ready. We can't be ready for what God wants to do. I'm telling you this, the church of Jesus Christ is on the precipice of the greatest revival that history has ever seen. But there is fear that is holding us back. There is intimidation that is holding us back. There is things that are holding us back from collectively reaching the places that God has for us. Amen, Pastor Eric. That's a good point. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you for that pity clap. All right. But the Lord, <laughs> you're not recording this, are you? Okay. <laughs> but the, see, it's funny because I'm, I'm, I'm like the youth guy so I can get away with certain things. 
uh, for now. So I'm just going to kind of milk it as we go, as long as I can. Okay. But the Lord said to Gideon. Okay, so they went from 32,000 down to 10,000. Okay, they had a huge army, and now it's a little smaller. But they're still like, okay, you know, maybe we can like surprise attack, or I'm sure Gideon's kind of going through his mind trying to figure out how they can possibly pull this off. This is what the word of God says in verse 4. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will sift them there for you. Thanks, God. Why don't you just sift my men? Thanks. Appreciate it. (laughs) If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord said to him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues like dogs from those who kneel down to drink. Who lap the wa- 300 men lapped with their hands to their mouths. All the rest got down on their kn- knees to drink. 9,300 men got down, put their faces to the water, and lapped like a dog. Have you ever like watched a dog drink? It's odd, right? They stick their tongues down in there. It's just, it, it's weird. But all of a sudden, there was another sifting, okay? Now, in, in, as I studied out the maps, the enemy, the Midian army was about four miles away still. But God is saying in this moment to these people, we need to be alert and we need to be vigilant to what the enemy is doing. We don't want to take our eyes off the battlefield. We want to make sure that we stay ready. Because how many of you know the enemy wants to keep us down, wants to keep us destroyed, wants to keep us not believing for a miracle, wants to keep us doubting the providence of God, wants to keep us doubting the sovereignty of God, okay? So there was 300 men who uh, many scholars would say just reached down a little bit, grabbed it with their mouth like this. So that they were looking out at the battlefield. They were aware. They were vigilant. They were ready for whatever was going to happen. Even though they were four miles away, with which walking with an army takes some time. We are living in a culture today where we must be spiritually discerning and spiritually vigilant. If we take our eyes off of this, we are not going to be ready for what the enemy has planned. How many of you know victory is promised, but it's up for us to, to execute it. It's up to us to be ready to reach out and to grab it. And if we're not ready, it's going to be delayed. God is looking for those who are ready and vigilant to accomplish his purpose in this hour. Now, I, I can't help but think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, they were the only three young men, young Jewish men, young Hebrew men that stood in the courts of Babylon. When the king said, bow down and worship this statue, only three stood up and defied him. Only three. When the music was playing and everyone was going one direction, they stood up, they stayed vigilant, they stayed ready, and they stayed strong, and that got to be difficult to be a foreigner in a foreign land and to stand up against the entire wave of culture and the peer pressure and social pressure, but they stood strong. They knew what their God had said. They knew that their God was going to deliver their people. They knew that if they bowed down, it was over. They will have publicly submitted to that culture and to that ideology. Daniel stood alone too. Daniel's a great book of strong men who stood for the promises of God, stayed aware. Daniel, and I was thinking about this, Daniel stood alone. There was a decree in the land that said, you can pray to no one but the king. Daniel was like, nah. And he went and he prayed by his window for the entire community to see. And he stood up against that law and he said, I will pray to no one but God. What happened? He was faced with a lion's den. And I began to think about that, you know, standing on the edge of a lion's den. Am I willing 
to be eaten alive by, like, that's got to hurt. To be eaten by lions? Lions, okay? To be thrown into a pit of hungry lions. He knew that was coming, but he was ready to die if need be. He was ready to sacrifice if need be. How different would the Bible be if he gave in to the fear? If he wasn't ready to stand against the entire, one of the most powerful and wicked cultures of the time. Living ready will cost us comfort. It'll cost us convenience. And it'll even cost us popularity. Living ready will require constant spiritual discernment and vigilance write that down constant discernment and vigilance when we look at the culture when i like it's so important i believe to make sure that our faces are in this book that when we look at what's happening in society when we look at what's happening with economics when we look at what's happening with our culture when we look at what's happening in the political realm when we look at what's happening in the uh, sociological constructs that we look at it through a biblical lens because that will help us to discern right from wrong evil from the truth lies from the truth we need the scriptures to guide us Moving on to Judges 7, 9 through 12. He goes on and says this. So now he's come down to 300. 300 men. 300 men made the cut. You have, like, I'm sorry. Like, I wonder what's going on in Gideon's mind. He's like, did you see that army, God? Like, legit, we know what happens in the story. But imagine living it. Imagine being the commander of that army, and you're already insecure. You've already had your struggles with faith. You're already trying to live ready. And all of a sudden, you've lost your entire army except for 300 men. The odds are not in your favor at that point, naturally. Verse 9 says this. During the night, the Lord said to Gideon, Well, am I in the right place? Okay, sorry. During the night, the Lord said to Gideon, go up, go down against the camp because I am going to give it into your hands. If you are afraid to attack, that's interesting. So he got rid of 12,000, 22,000 that were afraid. He got rid of 9,300 that weren't ready. And now he still says, look, if you're afraid. He is not saying, look, you're not going to be nervous. You're not going to be afraid. But what he's saying is, don't partner with it. I have given you a spirit of power and of a sound mind so that you don't have to partner with that fear. That's what he's saying with this. Listen, if you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant, Pura, and listen to what they are saying. Afterwards, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So now he's saying... Oh, by the way, go down the hill, sneak up real close to the camp, and then listen. Are you crazy? You want me to go listen to the camp? Like, you should have, like, a cache of guns or bow and arrows or whatever their thing was. Like, where's the spears? Where's the catapults? I don't need that. I don't want to go down to the enemy's camp and listening to what they're saying. I'm sure that there is an internal dialogue like that happening in Gideon, and I know that because that would be the internal dialogue that I would be having. God, you've got to be, I just can't. Like, there's got to be a wrestling match going on in Gideon's heart. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura, his servant, went down to the outposts of the camp. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and all other eastern people had settled in the valley thick as locusts. So now it's just not the Midianites, the Amalekites joined the fight, okay? And then they got some other buddies from other places. Israel had... A lot of enemies. The camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. When you look out, all you see is the army. All you see is your enemies. Every single one wants your destruction. Every single one wants your demise. Every single one of them wants to see you defeated. And that's all you can see. But God is like, look past that and listen to what's happening in the camp. Gideon arrived just as the man was telling 
a friend a dream. So we have two enemies now having a conversation. This guy says, I had a dream. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp, and it struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, whoa, this can, well, was paraphrased, this can only, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Josh, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. The enemy is already declaring defeat. 300 dudes up at the top of the hill, hundreds of thousands in the valley. And the enemy is the one declaring defeat. Isn't that interesting? God's math is a little bit different. God is always pushing us to victory, saying, be ready for victory. It's coming. It may not look like it. Okay, we started a business in the middle of a pandemic, and it has been a great servant to us. If we looked at what was going on around us, we wouldn't have done that. But God is saying, look past the circumstances, look past the numbers, look past the situation. Your eyes can deceive you. And I began to think about my own life. You know, I said, starting a business in the middle of a pandemic is crazy. Also, planting a church. My wife and I are, are planting a church, which is a massive leap of faith. And I'm realizing it more and more every day, how much faith you need. We have a drum set, a sound board, and two microphones to go out and reach people for Jesus. That doesn't add up. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't, like, what are we, like, how, how is this going to work, God? But God just pushes us forward. He said, just be ready. Just be ready for what's going to happen. Be ready for what I'm going to do. So many of us here at Abundant Life, which will always be a part of my heart, we've lived ready. We were ready. When we had to stop Summerfest and switch gears, we switched it. When we had to move from one building to the next, we switched it. When things happen, we switched it. Why? Because Abundant Life lives ready. That's one thing about this church that makes me so proud. We were ready. Last year, when we realized we couldn't have camp, we, and we took a massive camp and we brought it to home base and shrunk it in a matter of two weeks, which is one of the biggest efforts that our church does on a year. But we did it. Why? Because we were ready. Our entire team was ready. <laughs> the enemy already knows they're defeated. The enemy already knows. They think that, see, Satan always, he thinks he's won in our lives. He thinks he's got you down. He thinks you're going to renounce your faith. He thinks you're going to turn on your spouse. He thinks you're going to go bankrupt. He wants you to believe these things, but in actuality, he knows God is about to show up in a major way. He knows that God is about to do something supernatural that only he can do. When you think you've got to the end of all your resources, God is saying, I don't need your resources. I have my own. Yesterday, we, I went up with and gathered with a bunch of other churches. And uh, we went up to, a, to an empty parking lot. Some of you men were, were there with us. And we stood in the middle of this parking lot in Bonnie Lake. And we began to cry out to God that God was going to bring revival to our region. It's a... It's a Washington State Prayer Caucus commissioned event that we've been going to different cities and praying and crying out to God over these cities. And the proclamation is victory, 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 despite the poverty in the communities, despite the violence in the communities, despite the drugs in the communities, despite the suicide in the communities, despite the anxiety in the communities, God's people are now beginning to proclaim victory because we are ready for it. We are staying vigilant. We are staying discerning. Okay? God is creating a movement of believers that are ready and willing to take ground, to take land, to do something supernatural in our region. How many of you know Abundant Life has a greater reach than just Ording? Abundant Life reaches all over the world. Okay? They're about to send us out to the far reaches of the region. That's all of you. Sending us out to the far reaches of the region. Why? Because God is multiplying his people. God is multiplying a move of the Spirit. 
When the church prays, I like this. I, I, I want to say I made it up, but I don't think I did. When the church prays, the enemy pays. I like that. Bumper sticker. When the church prays, the enemy prays. When we come together as a church and we stay discerning, we stay in the word, we stay ready, we stay ready in prayer and spiritual warfare, we're going to begin to see the enemy crumble and crumble and crumble, just like Gideon is just about to see with his 300 men. How many of you know it does not matter how many people we can attract on a Sunday morning? If we're ready and willing, we will see a move of God. <laughs> when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he worshiped God. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, Get up. The Lord has given the Midianites' camp into your hand. Dividing 300 men up into three companies, he placed trumpets, okay, empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. So I don't know how that worked. I don't know, like, how he kept the fire from going out. But there was a trumpet and then a jar and then a torch. And he said, watch me. He told them, follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets... Then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle of the watch, just as they had changed the guard. So they stood around on the edge, if you can picture it in your mind. Nobody knew they were up there, standing on the edge, looking down at what a moment ago they thought was defeat, at a moment ago they thought was certain death, at a moment ago they thought was going to be the demise of their complete army. But Gideon worshipped God. Gideon trusts God. Gideon was ready, and his heart was ready to obey what God told him. And what we see next is something so beautiful. You see... We live in an urgent hour in our church. God is wanting to position his church as small as it seems, as tiny as we seem, with the little things we have that we don't think are very uh, effective. God is saying, oh no, I'm going to defeat the enemy in your region. I'm going to defeat the enemy in your life. I'm going to defeat the enemy in your family. I'm going to bring your sons and daughters back to God. I'm going to restore your finances. I'm going to restore family relationships that bitterness has plagued for generations. God is positioning his people. I began to think about the fight that I'm facing. As a, as a next-gen pastor, there is a fight for the next generation. The enemy has came into the camp and has stolen a generation. Brainwashed them. I won't get, you, you can Decide what, whatever you want. I don't want to get into it. Brainwash them. Turn their hearts away from their parents. Turn their hearts away from God. But God is saying, a church that's ready is going to bring them back. There was a song that we would sing in our, our, our old revival days. I went to the enemy's camp, and I took back what he stole from me. I don't know what God has stolen from you, but it's time to take it back. I don't know what, what the enemy has lied to you about, but it's time to silence the lie. And we are positioned now to take it back. We are positioned now for victory. Can I get the... Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. You know what that means? Okay, joke time. I got something serious to talk about, but... So... When I was growing up, I, before we got to Abundant Life, I'm totally going off the script, but before we got to Abundant Life, uh, our pastor, what he would do when he wanted the uh, worship team to come up, he would go like this, and he would arrange it so that you would see it in the screen at the bottom left corner, and the worship team would know that's when it was time to come up, <laughs> except when they weren't paying attention, and then there, it'd just be funny. So I totally stole all your stuff. I want to make sure I close this thing right, land this plane. Uh, I'm going to read the Bible. Here's what happened is they stood on the edge. 
And imagine the emotions that were going on inside of those people. Imagine, I mean, just what they were facing, the, the, the thoughts. If this goes wrong, they're thinking, we're toast. We're toast. Some of us don't want to confront what the enemy's trying to take. We don't want to confront the enemy because we're afraid of the repercussions. We're afraid that it's going to get worse. This is what happened. They blew their trumpets. They broke their jars that were in their hand. And the three companies all blew the trumpets and jars, grasping the torches in their left hands, holding it in their right. And the trumpets were about to blow. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. A lot of times in biblical narrative, the jar will represent just the, the, the temple. Like we're, we're the temple of God. You know, that old band, Jars of Clay. Our, our bodies are just jars of clay. And when we become broken before the Lord, God begins to move. God begins to redeem. God begins to restore. God begins to bring reconciliation to our lives, to our relationships, to our finance, to our health, to every area of our lives. And when, that, when we become broken before the Lord, our torch shines and it's bright for everyone to see. And how many of you know there ain't no principality, there ain't no power, there ain't no demonic force that's going to run toward the light of Jesus Christ. They are running in the other direction. Look what happens. While the men held his position around the camp, all the Midians ran, crying as they fled. When 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. They didn't even have to fight. They, all they had to do was be obedient. All they had to do was trust. All they had to do was be ready. And I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what, what battlefield lays in front of you that looks impossible. But I want to remind you that when you obey God, when you surrender to God, you will see miracle working power like you have never experienced before. Okay? And God's word will back up that statement. This is so unprofessional. Living ready causes us, listen, I'm going to read this twice. Living ready causes us to see the invisible, choose the imperishable, but to do the impossible. You know, when I was growing up in revival, I, I always wanted to see dead raised. I always wanted to see arms and limbs grow back. I wanted to see, you know, nowadays I want to see hair grow back on people's heads. Come on, guys, you know, you know, you know, it's all good. But I think that the greatest miracles lie when relationships are restored, when marriages are healed, when kids come back to their parents, when, when, when finances are restored, when people who were in foreclosure, all of a sudden God does a miracle and he provides something great and they get to keep their home. Those are the greatest miracles. When you go to the doctor and you're afraid for the report, but it comes back a clean bill of health, those are the miracles that I want to see. And then finally... I'm going to end with a verse. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand up as we close. I'm a Pentecostal preacher, so I have nine closes. That was a joke. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Where have you been this whole time? <laughs> People are like, is he joking? Yes. But not about this. You see... We live in a culture that wants to silence the church. And I'm not making a political statement. I'm not making an economic statement. I'm making a spiritual statement. We live in a culture that wants to silence the voice of the church, wants to silence the voice of the men and women of God, wants to silence the truth from being told, and they are working very hard. You can't silence what is eternal. You can't silence what was there before you had the ability to unplug the microphone. Isaiah 46, 13 says this. For I am ready to set things right. Not in the distant future, but...
but right now. I am ready to save Jerusalem and show my glory to Israel. And I want to extend this to you for you to think and to consider that God is ready to do some things right now. Many of you have labored your lives in prayer, in trust, in faith. Like Gideon, you feel like you've lost all your resources and you're standing on the edge looking down in the valley at things that you are certain is going to meet your demise. It's going to destroy you. It's going to cause you to go under to where you can never get back up again. God is saying, become broken before me. Allow the fire of my presence to shine in your life. And watch what I do to the enemy. Why are we afraid to talk about that? Why are we afraid to claim the victory that God promised us in his word? Before the foundations of the earth, sin was destroyed at the cross. Sin was actually destroyed the moment it, in, it invaded the world because God had a plan. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for your families. God has a plan for your marriage. God has a plan for your kids. God has a plan for your health. God has a plan for your finances. God has a plan for your vocation. And I think now's the time to grab a hold of it. Now's the time to become broken before the Lord. So I'm going to close. We're going to sing one more song. And I'm going to open this altar up. There's something about the altar. When we place our broken weary pieces on the altar and the fire of God comes down and burns every way, away everything that is unnecessary, what rises up is what God intended in the first place. I walked into a church in 1999, a drug addict and alcoholic, long hair with cigarettes in their pocket, wanted nothing to do with God. But that night, God touched me and I will never be the same again because I allowed myself to come up to an altar like this and become broken before the Lord and said, God, if you can take this and you can make something out of this, it's yours. And look at the woman I married. That's kind of a miracle right there. <laughs> but I'm going to pray. I do want to open up the altars and then uh, Pastor Eric will come up and close when we're done. Make sure that you... Uh, Greet some people on the, that was another joke. <laughs> Make sure if you're new here that you greet one of the, one of the leaders here or greet somebody, I met some of you. Pastor Brad will be next, here back next week. Make sure you text him, send him an encouraging message. Because I know he hates missing church. He's a church junkie, so send him a message. Continue to pray for Edwin, our dear Edwin, who is, I, I believe he's doing a lot better, but I, I think he's still in the hospital. Um, continue to pray for a complete healing for him. And uh, yeah, let's pray and get so, and then I'll officially dismiss in a minute. So Lord, I just thank you, God, for the victory. I thank you have called us to be ready. I thank you have called us to be discerning and alert in this season, God. And I pray that you would empower your people, God, to not look at the enemy and be afraid, but look at the enemy and celebrate the victory that is on the horizon. God, you know every situation in this room. You know every, every, every circumstance. You know every relationship, every financial situation, health situation, relational situation, God. And I pray that you would move among your people to show how powerful you truly are in this hour. That we would be a people of courage and a people who are ready in season and out of season to give a good report for the goodness of God. Let's worship. Unravel me with the melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I no longer slave to fear. I 
mother's womb you have chosen me Before we officially close, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, the bathrooms are right over there on that side of the portable. Um, if you would like to worship and uh, God with your obedience and giving, you can give online, you can give on the app, um, or we, we have a nice fancy black box for you to drop your tithe in there. And last thing before we close, can we pray for Israel? Can we pray for Israel just as a, as a community? Um, a lot going on there, and we need to uh, we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So that's how we're going to close today. So, Father God, we lift up your people. Your people are hurting. Your people are afraid. Your people are under attack. God, we ask that we have mercy on mercy on Israel, God. We partner with you, and we stand with your people, and we say, God, show your hand, strong and mighty. Protect the children, protect the old, protect the holy city, God, and that you would show yourself mighty in this situation. There is no political force, there is no terrorist organization that can stand against the people of the living God. And we know you have a plan and a purpose for that nation. And we offer our prayers to them as humble as they are and say, God, you would do a work. Protect Israel, we stand with them and the believers and the non-believers there that you would show that your son is the Messiah, that your son is the one you've been waiting for. So God, do a miracle. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless all of you. Thank you for your patience today and uh, go with God. <laughs>